Essays, Second Series, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essay number four, Manners. Read by Bob Neufeld. How near to good is what is fair, which we no sooner see but with the lines and outward air our senses taken be. Again yourselves compose, and now put all the aptness on a figure that portion or color can disclose, that if those silent arts were lost, design and picture, they might boast from you a newer ground, instructed by the heightening sense of dignity and reverence in their true motions found. Ben Jonson half the world it is said knows not how the other half live our exploring expedition saw the fiji islanders getting their dinner off human bones and they are said to eat their own wives and children the husbandry of the modern inhabitants of gournou west of old thebes is philosophical to a fault to set up their housekeeping nothing is requisite but two or three earthen pots a stone to grind meal and a mat which is the bed. The house, namely a tomb, is ready without rent or taxes. No rain can pass through the roof, and there is no door, for there is no want of one, as there is nothing to lose. If the house do not please them, they walk out and enter another, as there are several hundred at their command. It is somewhat singular, adds Belzoni, to whom we owe this account, to talk of happiness among people who live in sepulchres, among the corpses and rags of an ancient nation which they know nothing of. In the deserts of Borgu, the rock taboos still dwell in caves like cliff swallows, and the language of these negroes is compared by their neighbors to the shrieking of bats and to the whistling of birds. Again, the Bornuas have no proper names. Individuals are called after their height, thickness, or other accidental quality, and have nicknames merely. But the salt, the dates, the ivory, and the gold for which these horrible regions are visited find their way into countries where the purchaser and consumer can hardly be ranked in one race with these cannibals and man-stealers, countries where man serves himself with metals, wood, stone, glass, gum, cotton, silk, and wool, honors himself with architecture, writes laws, and contrives to execute his will through the hands of many nations, and especially establishes a select society running through all the countries of intelligent men, a self-constituted aristocracy or fraternity of the best, which without written law or exact usage of any kind perpetuates itself, colonizes every new planted island and adopts and makes its own whatever personal beauty or extraordinary native endowment anywhere appears. What fact more conspicuous in modern history than the creation of the gentleman? Chivalry is that, and loyalty is that, and in English literature half the drama and all the novels from Sir Philip Sidney to Sir Walter Scott paint this figure. The word gentleman, which, like the word Christian, must hereafter characterize the present and the few preceding centuries by the importance attached to it, is a homage to personal and incommunicable properties. Frivolous and fantastic additions have got associated with the name, but the steady interest of mankind in it must be attributed to the valuable properties which it designates. An element which unites all the most forcible persons of every country, makes them intelligible and agreeable to each other, and is somewhat so precise that it is at once felt if an individual lack the Masonic sign, cannot be any casual product, but must be an average result of the character and faculties universally found in men. It seems a certain permanent average, as the atmosphere is a permanent composition, whilst so many gases are combined only to be decompounded. Comme il faut is the Frenchman's description of good society, as we must be. It is a spontaneous fruit of talents and feelings of precisely that class who have most vigor, 
who take the lead in the world of this hour, and, though far from pure, far from constituting the gladdest and highest tone of human feeling, is as good as the whole society permits it to be. It is made of the spirit, more than the talent of men, and is a compound result into which every great force enters as an ingredient, namely virtue, wit, beauty, wealth, and power. There is something equivocal in all the words in use to express the excellence of manners and social cultivation, because the quantities are fluxional, and the last effect is assumed by the senses as the cause. The word gentleman has not any correlative abstract to express the quality. Gentility is mean, and gentiles is obsolete. But we must keep alive in the vernacular the distinction between fashion, a word of narrow and often sinister meaning, and the heroic character which the gentleman imports. The usual words, however, must be respected. They will be found to contain the root of the matter. The point of distinction in all this class of names, as courtesy, chivalry, fashion, and the like, is that the flower and fruit, not the grain of the tree, are contemplated. It is beauty which is the aim this time, and not worth. The result is now in question, although our words intimate well enough the popular feeling that the appearance supposes a substance. The gentleman is a man of truth, lord of his own actions, and expressing that lordship in his behavior, not in any manner dependent or servile, either on persons or opinions or possessions. Beyond this fact of truth and real force, the word denotes good nature or benevolence, manhood first, and then gentleness. The popular notion certainly adds a condition of ease and fortune, but that is a natural result of personal force and love, that they should possess and dispense the goods of the world. In times of violence, every eminent person must fall in with many opportunities to approve his stoutness and worth. Therefore every man's name that emerged at all from the mass in the feudal ages rattles in our ear like a flourish of trumpets. But personal force never goes out of fashion. That is still paramount to-day, and in the moving crowd of good society the men of valor and reality are known and rise to their natural place. The competition is transferred from war to politics and trade but the personal force appears readily enough in these new areas. Power first, or no leading class. In politics and in trade, bruisers and pirates are of better promise than talkers and clerks. God knows that all sorts of gentlemen knock at the door, but whenever used in strictness and with emphasis, the name will be found to point at original energy. It describes a man standing in his own right, and working after untaught methods. In a good lord there must first be a good animal, at least to the extent of yielding the incomparable advantage of animal spirits. The ruling class must have more, but they must have these, giving in every company the sense of power, which makes things easy to be done which daunt the wise. The society of the energetic class, in their friendly and festive meetings, is full of courage, and of attempts which intimidate the pale scholar. The courage which girls exhibit is like a battle of Lundy's Lane, or a sea-fight. The intellect relies on memory to make some supplies to face these extemporaneous squadrons, but memory is a base mendicant with basket and badge in the presence of these sudden masters. The rulers of society must be up to the work of the world, and equal to their versatile office, men of the right Caesarian pattern, who have great range of affinity. I am far from believing the timid maxim of Lord Falkland, that for ceremony there must go two to it, since a bold fellow will go through the cunningest forms, and am of opinion that the gentleman is the bold fellow whose forms are not to be broken through and only that plenteous nature is rightful master which is the complement of whatever person it converses with. My gentleman gives the law where he is. He will outpray saints in chapel, outgeneral veterans in the field, and outshine all courtesy in the hall. He is good company for pirates, and good with academicians, so that it is useless to fortify yourself against him, 
he has the private entrance to all minds, and I could as easily exclude myself as him. The famous gentlemen of Asia and Europe have been of this strong type. Saladin, Sapor, the Cid, Julius Caesar, Scipio, Alexander, Pericles, and the lordliest personages. They sat very carelessly in their chairs, and were too excellent themselves to value any condition at a high rate. A plentiful fortune is reckoned necessary in the popular judgment to the completion of this man of the world, and it is a material deputy which walks through the dance which the first has led. Money is not essential, but this wide affinity is, which transcends the habits of clique and caste, and makes itself felt by men of all classes. If the aristocrat is only valid in fashionable circles and not with truckmen, he will never be a leader in fashion. And if the man of the people cannot speak on equal terms with the gentleman, so that the gentleman shall perceive that he is already of his own order, he is not to be feared. Theogenes, Socrates, and Epaminondas are gentlemen of the best blood, who have chosen the condition of poverty when that of wealth was equally open to them. I use these old names, but the men I speak of are my contemporaries. Fortune will not supply to every generation one of these well-appointed knights, but every collection of men furnishes some example of the class, and the politics of this country and the trade of every town are controlled by these hardy and irresponsible doers, who have invention to take the lead and a broad sympathy which puts them in fellowship with crowds and makes their action popular. The manners of this class are observed and caught with devotion by men of taste. The association of these masters with each other, and with men intelligent of their merits, is mutually agreeable and stimulating. The good forms, the happiest expressions of each, are repeated and adopted. By swift consent everything superfluous is dropped, everything graceful is renewed. Fine manners show themselves formidable to the uncultivated man. They are a subtler science of defense to parry and intimidate, but once matched by the skill of the other party, they drop the point of the sword. Points and fences disappear, and the youth finds himself in a more transparent atmosphere, wherein life is a less troublesome game, and not a misunderstanding rises between the players. Manners aim to facilitate life, to get rid of impediments, and to bring the man pure to energize. They aid our dealing and conversation as a railway aids traveling, by getting rid of all avoidable obstructions of the road, and leaving nothing to be conquered but pure space. These forms very soon become fixed, and a fine sense of propriety is cultivated with the more heed that it becomes a badge of social and civil distinctions. Thus grows up fashion, an equivocal semblance, the most puissant, and the most fantastic and frivolous, the most feared and followed, and which morals and violence assault in vain. There exists a strict relation between the class of power and the exclusive and polished circles. The last are always filled or filling from the first. The strong men usually give some allowance even to the petulances of fashion for that affinity they find in it. Napoleon, child of the revolution, destroyer of the old noblesse, never ceased to court the Faubourg Saint-Germain, doubtless with the feeling that fashion is a homage to men of his stamp. Fashion, though in a strange way, represents all manly virtue. It is virtue gone to seed. It is a kind of posthumous honor. It does not often caress the great, but the children of the great. It is a hall of the past. It usually sets its face against the great of this hour. Great men are not commonly in its halls. They are absent in the field. They are working, not triumphing. Fashion is made up of their children, of those who, through the value and virtue of somebody, have acquired luster to their name, marks of distinction, means of cultivation and generosity, and in their physical organization a certain health and excellence which secures to them, if not the highest power to work, yet high power to enjoy. The class of power, the working heroes, the Cortes, the Nelson, the Napoleon, 
see that this is the festivity and permanent celebration of such as they. That fashion is funded talent, is Mexico, Marengo, and Trafalgar beaten out thin. That the brilliant names of fashion run back to just such busy names as their own, fifty or sixty years ago. They are the sowers, their sons shall be the reapers, and their sons, in the ordinary course of things, must yield the possession of the harvest to new competitors with keener eyes and stronger frames. The city is recruited from the country. In the year 1805, it is said, every legitimate monarch in Europe was imbecile. The city would have died out, rotted, and exploded long ago, but that it was reinforced from the fields. It is only country which came to town day before yesterday, that is, city and court today. Aristocracy and fashion are certain inevitable results. These mutual selections are indestructible. If they provoke anger in the least favored class, and the excluded majority revenge themselves on the excluding minority by the strong hand and kill them, at once a new class finds itself at the top, as certainly as cream rises in a bowl of milk. And if the people should destroy class after class, until two men only were left, one of these would be the leader, and would be involuntarily served and copied by the other. You may keep this minority out of sight and out of mind, but it is tenacious of life and is one of the estates of the realm. I am the more struck with this tenacity when I see its work. It respects the administration of such unimportant matters that we should not look for any durability in its rule. We sometimes meet men under some strong moral influence, as a patriotic, a literary, a religious movement, and feel that the moral sentiment rules man and nature. We think all other distinctions and ties will be slight and fugitive, this of caste or fashion, for example, yet come from year to year, and see how permanent that is, in this Boston or New York life of man, where too it has not the least countenance from the law of the land, not in Egypt or in India a firmer or more impassable line. Here are associations whose ties go over and under and through it, a meeting of merchants, a military corps, a college class, a fire club, a professional association, a political, a religious convention. The persons seem to draw inseparably near, yet that assembly once dispersed, its members will not in the year meet again. Each returns to his degree in the scale of good society. Porcelain remains porcelain, and earthen earthen. The objects of fashion may be frivolous, or fashion may be objectless, but the nature of this union and selection can be neither frivolous nor accidental. Each man's rank in that perfect graduation depends on some symmetry in his structure, or some agreement in his structure to the symmetry of society. Its doors bar instantaneously to a natural claim of their own kind. A natural gentleman finds his way in, and will keep the oldest patrician out who has lost his intrinsic rank. Fashion understands itself. Good breeding and personal superiority of whatever country readily fraternize with those of each other. The chiefs of savage tribes have distinguished themselves in London and Paris by the purity of their tumour. To say what good of fashion we can, it rests on reality and hates nothing so much as pretenders. To exclude and mystify pretenders and send them into everlasting coventry is its delight. We condemn in turn every other gift of men of the world, but the habit, even in little and the least matters, of not appealing to any but our own sense of propriety constitutes the foundation of all chivalry. There is almost no kind of self-reliance, so it be sane and proportioned, which fashion does not occasionally adopt and give it the freedom of its saloons. A sainted soul is always elegant, and, if it will, passes unchallenged into the most guarded ring. But so will Jock the teamster pass in some crisis that brings him thither, and find favor as long as his head is not giddy with the new circumstance, and the iron shoes do not wish to dance in waltzes and cotillions. But there is nothing settled in manners, 
but the laws of behavior yield to the energy of the individual. The maiden at her first ball, the countryman at a city dinner, believes that there is a ritual according to which every act and compliment must be performed, or the failing party must be cast out of this presence. Later they learn that good sense and character make their own forms every moment, and speak or abstain, take wine or refuse it, stay or go, sit in a chair or sprawl with children on the floor, or stand on their head, or what else soever, in a new and aboriginal way and that strong will is always in fashion, let who will be unfashionable. All that fashion demands is composure and self-content. A circle of men perfectly well-bred would be a company of sensible persons in which every man's native manners and character appeared. If the fashionist have not this quality, he is nothing. We are such lovers of self-reliance that we excuse in a man many sins if he will show us a complete satisfaction in his position, which asks no leave to be of mine or any man's good opinion. But any deference to some eminent man or woman of the world forfeits all privilege of nobility. He is an underling. I have nothing to do with him. I will speak with his master. A man should not go where he cannot carry his whole sphere and society with him. Not bodily, the whole circle of his friends, but atmospherically. He should preserve in a new company the same attitude of mind and reality of relation which his daily associates draw him to, else he is shorn of his best beams, and will be an orphan in the merriest club. If you can see Vich Ian Vohr with his tail on, but Vich Ian Vohr must always carry his belongings in some fashion, if not added as honor, then severed as disgrace. There will always be in society certain persons who are mercuries of its approbation, and whose glance will at any time determine for the curious their standing in the world. These are the chamberlains of the lesser gods. Accept their coldness as an omen of grace with the loftiest deities, and allow them all their privilege. They are clear in their office, nor could they be thus formidable without their own merits. But do not measure the importance of this class by their pretension, or imagine that a fop can be the dispenser of honor and shame. They pass also at their just rate. For how can they otherwise, in circles which exist as a sort of herald's office for the sifting of character? As the first thing man requires of man is reality, so that appears in all forms of society. We pointedly and by name introduce the parties to each other. Know you before all heaven and earth that this is Andrew and this is Gregory. They look each other in the eye, they grasp each other's hand to identify and signalize each other. It is a great satisfaction. A gentleman never dodges, his eyes look straight forward, and he assures the other party, first of all, that he has been met. For what is it that we seek in so many visits and hospitalities? Is it your draperies, pictures, and decorations? Or do we not insatiably ask, Was a man in the house? I may easily go into a great household where there is much substance, excellent provision for comfort, luxury, and taste, and yet not encounter there any amphitryon who shall subordinate these appendages. I may go into a cottage, and find a farmer who feels that he is the man I have come to see, and fronts me accordingly. It was therefore a very natural point of old feudal etiquette that a gentleman who received a visit, though it were of his sovereign, should not leave his roof, but should wait his arrival at the door of his house. No house, though it were the Tuileries or the Escurial, is good for anything without a master, and yet we are not often gratified by this hospitality. Everybody we know surrounds himself with a fine house, fine books, conservatory, gardens, equipage, and all manner of toys, as screens to interpose between himself and his guest. Does it not seem as if a man were of a very sly, elusive nature, and dreaded nothing so much as a full rencontre front to front with his fellow? It were unmerciful, I know, quite to abolish the use of these screens, which are of eminent convenience, whether the guest is too great or too little. We call together many friends who keep each other in play, 
or by luxuries and ornaments we amuse the young people and guard our retirement. Or if perchance a searching realist comes to our gate, before whose eye we have no care to stand, then again we run to our curtain and hide ourselves as Adam at the voice of the Lord God in the garden. Cardinal Caprata, the Pope's legate at Paris, defended himself from the glances of Napoleon by an immense pair of green spectacles. Napoleon remarked them, and speedily managed to rally them off, and yet Napoleon, in his turn, was not great enough with eight hundred thousand troops at his back to face a pair of free-born eyes, but fenced himself with etiquette and within triple barriers of reserve. And as all the world knows from Madame de Stael, was wont, when he found himself observed, to discharge his face of all expression. But emperors and rich men are by no means the most skilful masters of good manners. No rent roll nor army list can dignify skulking and dissimulation, and the first point of courtesy must always be truth, as really all the forms of good breeding point that way. I have just been reading, in Mr. Hazlitt's translation, Montaigne's account of his journey into Italy, and am struck with nothing more agreeably than the self-respecting fashions of the time. His arrival in each place, the arrival of a gentleman of France, is an event of some consequence. Wherever he goes, he pays a visit to whatever prince or gentleman of note resides upon his road, as a duty to himself and to civilization. When he leaves any house in which he has lodged for a few weeks, he causes his arms to be painted and hung up as a perpetual sign to the house, as was the custom of gentlemen. The compliment of this graceful self-respect, and that of all the points of good breeding I must require and insist upon, is deference. I like that every chair should be a throne and hold a king. I prefer a tendency to stateliness to an excess of fellowship. Let the incommunicable objects of nature and the metaphysical isolation of man teach us independence. Let us not be too much acquainted. I would have a man enter his house through a hall filled with heroic and sacred sculptures, that he might not want the hint of tranquillity and self-poise. We should meet each morning as from foreign countries, and spending the day together, should depart at night as into foreign countries. In all things I would have the island of a man inviolate. Let us sit apart as the gods, talking from peak to peak all around Olympus. No degree of affection need invade this religion. This is myrrh and rosemary to keep the other sweet. Lovers should guard their strangeness. If they forgive too much, all slides into confusion and meanness. It is easy to push this deference to a Chinese etiquette, but coolness and absence of heat and haste indicate fine qualities. A gentleman makes no noise. A lady is serene. Proportionate is our disgust at these invaders, who fill a studious house with blast and running, to secure some paltry convenience. Not less I dislike a low sympathy of each with his neighbor's needs. Must we have a good understanding with one another's palates? As foolish people who have lived long together know when each wants salt or sugar. I pray my companion, if he wishes for bread, to ask me for bread, if he wishes for sassafras or arsenic, to ask me for them, and not to hold out his plate as if I knew already. Every natural function can be dignified by deliberation and privacy. Let us leave hurry to slaves. The compliments and ceremonies of our breeding should signify, however remotely, the recollection of the grandeur of our destiny. The flower of courtesy does not very well bide handling. But if we dare to open another leaf, and explore what parts go to its conformation, we shall find also an intellectual quality. To the leaders of men, the brain as well as the flesh and the heart must furnish a proportion. Defect in manners is usually the defect of fine perceptions. Men are too coarsely made for the delicacy of beautiful carriage and customs. It is not quite sufficient to good breeding, a union of kindness and independence. We imperatively require a perception of and an homage to beauty in our companions. Other virtues are in request in the field and workyard, but a certain degree of taste is not to be spared in those we sit with. 
I could better eat with one who did not respect the truth or the laws than with a sloven and unpresentable person. Moral qualities rule the world, but at short distances the senses are despotic. The same discrimination of fit and fair runs out, if with less rigor, into all parts of life. The average spirit of the energetic class is good sense, acting under certain limitations and to certain ends. It entertains every natural gift. Social in its nature, it respects everything which tends to unite men. It delights in measure. The love of beauty is mainly the love of measure or proportion. The person who screams, or uses the superlative degree, or converses with heat, puts whole drawing-rooms to flight. If you wish to be loved, love measure. You must have genius or a prodigious usefulness if you will hide the want of measure. This perception comes in to polish and perfect the parts of the social instrument. Society will pardon much to genius and special gifts, but being in its nature a convention, it loves what is conventional, or what belongs to coming together. That makes the good and bad of manners, namely what helps and hinders fellowship. For fashion is not good sense absolute, but relative, not good sense private, but good sense entertaining company. It hates corners and sharp points of character, hates quarrelsome, egotistical, solitary, and gloomy people, hates whatever can interfere with total blending of parties, while it values all peculiarities as in the highest degree refreshing, which can consist with good fellowship and besides the general infusion of wit to heighten civility, the direct splendor of intellectual power is ever welcome in fine society as the costliest addition to its rule and its credit. The dry light must shine in to adorn our festival, but it must be tempered and shaded, or that will also offend. Accuracy is essential to beauty, and quick perceptions to politeness, but not too quick perceptions. One may be too punctual and too precise. He must leave the omniscience of business at the door when he comes into the palace of beauty. Society loves creole natures and the sleepy languishing manners, so that they cover sense, grace, and good will. The hour of drowsy strength which disarms criticism, perhaps because such a person seems to reserve himself for the rest of the game and not spend himself on surfaces. An ignoring eye, which does not see the annoyances, shifts, and inconveniences that cloud the brow and smother the voice of the sensitive. Therefore, besides personal force and so much perception as constitutes unerring taste, society demands in its patrician class another element already intimated, which it significantly terms good nature. Expressing all degrees of generosity, from the lowest willingness and faculty to oblige, up to the heights of magnanimity and love. Insight we must have, or we shall run against one another and miss the way to our food. But intellect is selfish and barren. The secret of success in society is a certain heartiness and sympathy. A man who is not happy in the company cannot find any word in his memory that will fit the occasion. All his information is a little impertinent. A man who is happy there finds in every turn of the conversation equally lucky occasions for the introduction of that which he has to say. The favorites of society, and what it calls whole souls, are able men, and of more spirit than wit, who have no uncomfortable egotism, but who exactly fill the hour and the company, contented and contenting, at a marriage or a funeral, a ball or a jury, a water-party or a shooting-match. England, which is rich in gentlemen, furnished in the beginning of the present century a good model of that genius in which the world loves in Mr. Fox, who added to his great abilities the most social disposition and real love of men. Parliamentary history has few better passages than the debate in which Burke and Fox separated in the House of Commons, when Fox urged on his old friend the claims of old friendship with such tenderness that the house was moved to tears. Another anecdote is so close to my matter that I must hazard the story. A tradesman who had long dunned him for the note of three hundred guineas found him one day counting gold and demanded payment. 
No, said Fox, I owe this money to Sheridan. It is a debt of honor. If an accident should happen to me, he has nothing to show. Then, said the creditor, I change my debt into a debt of honor, and tore the note in pieces. Fox thanked the man for his confidence, and paid him, saying his debt was of older standing, and Sheridan must wait. Lover of liberty, friend of the Hindu, friend of the African slave, he possessed a great personal popularity, and Napoleon said of him on the occasion of his visit to Paris in 1805, Mr. Fox will always hold the first place in an assembly at the Tuileries. We may easily seem ridiculous in our eulogy of courtesy whenever we insist on benevolence as its foundation. The painted phantasm fashion rises to cast a species of derision on what we say, but I will neither be driven from some allowance to fashion as a symbolic institution, nor from the belief that love is the basis of courtesy. We must obtain that, if we can, but by all means we must affirm this. Life owes much of its spirit to its sharp contrasts. Fashion, which affects to be honor, is often, in all men's experience, only a ballroom code. Yet so long as it is the highest circle in the imagination of the best heads on the planet, there is something necessary and excellent in it, for it is not to be supposed that men have agreed to be the dupes of anything preposterous, and the respect which these mysteries inspire in the most rude and sylvan characters, and the curiosity with which details of high life are read, betray the universality of the love of cultivated manners. I know that a comic disparity would be felt if we should enter the acknowledged first circles, and apply these terrific standards of justice, beauty, and benefit to the individuals actually found there. Monarchs and heroes, sages and lovers, these gallants are not. There is not only the right of conquest, which genius pretends, the individual demonstrating his natural aristocracy best of the best, but less claims will pass for the time, for fashion loves lions, and points like Circe to her homed company. This gentleman is this afternoon arrived from Denmark, and that is my Lord Ride who came yesterday from Baghdad. Here is Captain Fries from Cape Termagen, and Captain Symes from the interior of the earth, and Monsieur Jovert, who came down this morning in a balloon, Mr. Hobnail the reformer, and Reverend Julbat, who has converted the whole torrid zone in his Sunday school, and Signor Torre del Greco, who extinguished Vesuvius by pouring it into the Bay of Naples, Spahi, the Persian ambassador, and Tulwil Shan, the exiled Nabob of Nepal, whose saddle is the new moon. But these are monsters of one day, and to-morrow will be dismissed to their holes and dens for in these rooms every chair is waited for. The artist, the scholar, and in general the clerisy, wins their way up into these places and get represented here, somewhat on this footing of conquest. Another mode is to pass through all the degrees, spending a year and a day in St. Michael's Square, being steeped in cologne water, and perfumed, and dined, and introduced, and properly grounded in all the biography and politics and anecdotes of the boudoirs. Yet these fineries may have grace and wit. Let there be grotesque sculpture about the gates and offices of temples. Let the creed and commandments even have the saucy homage of parody. The forms of politeness universally express benevolence in superlative degrees. What if they are in the mouths of selfish men, and used as means of selfishness? What if the false gentleman always bows the true out of the world? What if the false gentleman contrives so as to address his companion as civilly to exclude all others from his discourse, and also to make them feel excluded? Real service will not lose its nobleness. All generosity is not merely French and sentimental, nor is it to be concealed that living blood and a passion of kindness does at last distinguish God's gentlemen from fashions. The epitaph of Sir Jenkin Grout is not wholly unintelligible to the present age. Here lies Sir Jenkin Grout, who loved his friend and persuaded his enemy. What his mouth ate, his hand paid for. What his servants robbed, he restored. 
If a woman give him pleasure, he supported her in pain. He never forgot his children, and whoso touched his finger drew after it his whole body. Even the line of heroes is not utterly extinct. There is still ever some admirable person in plain clothes, standing on the wharf, who jumps in to rescue a drowning man. There is still some absurd inventor of charities, some guide and comforter of runaway slaves, some friend of Poland, some Philhellene, some fanatic who plants shade trees for the second and third generation, and orchards when he is grown old, some well-conceived piety, some just man happy in an ill fame, some youth ashamed of the favors of fortune, and impatiently casting them on other shoulders. And these are the centers of society, on which it returns for fresh impulses. These are the creators of fashion, which is an attempt to organize beauty of behavior. The beautiful and the generous are, in the theory, the doctors and apostles of this church, Scipio and the Cid, and Sir Philip Sidney, and Washington, and every pure and valiant heart who worshipped beauty by word and by deed. The persons who constitute the natural aristocracy are not found in the actual aristocracy, or only on its edge, as the chemical energy of the spectrum is found to be greatest just outside the spectrum. Yet that is the infirmity of the seneschals, who do not know their sovereign when he appears. The theory of society supposes the existence and sovereignty of these. It divines afar off their coming. It says with the elder gods, As heaven and earth are fairer far than chaos and blank darkness, though once chiefs, and as we show beyond that heaven and earth, in form and shape compact and beautiful, so on our heels a fresh perfection treads, a power more strong in beauty, born of us, and fated to excel us as we pass in glory that old darkness. For tis the eternal law that first in beauty shall be first in might. Therefore within the ethnical circle of good society there is a narrower and higher circle, concentration of its light and flower of courtesy, to which there is always a tacit appeal of pride and reference as to its inner and imperial court, the parliament of love and chivalry. And this is constituted of those persons in whom heroic dispositions are native, with the love of beauty, the delight in society, and the power to embellish the passing day. If the individuals who compose the purest circles of aristocracy in Europe, the guarded blood of centuries, should pass in review, in such manner as that we could at leisure and critically inspect their behavior, we might find no gentleman and no lady, for although excellent specimens of courtesy and high breeding would gratify us in the assemblage, in the particulars we should detect offense, because elegance comes of no breeding, but of birth. There must be romance of character, or the most fastidious exclusion of impertinencies will not avail. It must be genius which takes that direction. It must be not courteous, but courtesy. High behavior is as rare in fiction as it is in fact. Scott is praised for the fidelity with which he painted the demeanor and conversation of the superior classes. Certainly kings and queens, nobles and great ladies, had some right to complain of the absurdity that had been put in their mouths before the days of Waverley. But neither does Scott's dialogue bear criticism. His lords brave each other in smart, epigrammatic speeches, but the dialogue is in costume, and does not please on the second reading. It is not warm with life. In Shakespeare alone the speakers do strut and bridle, the dialogue is easily great, and he adds to so many titles that of being the best-bred man in England and in Christendom. Once or twice in a lifetime we are permitted to enjoy the charm of noble manners, in the presence of a man or woman who have no bar in their nature, but whose character emanates freely in their word and gesture. A beautiful form is better than a beautiful face. A beautiful behavior is better than a beautiful form. It gives a higher pleasure than statues or pictures. It is the finest of the fine arts. 
a man is but a little thing in the midst of the objects of nature, yet by the moral quality radiating from his countenance he may abolish all considerations of magnitude, and in his manners equal the majesty of the world. I have seen an individual whose manners, though wholly within the conventions of elegant society, were never learned there, but were original and commanding, and held out protection and prosperity, one who did not need the aid of a court suit, but carried the holiday in his eye, who exhilarated the fancy by flinging wide the doors of new modes of existence, who shook off the captivity of etiquette with happy, spirited bearing, good-natured and free as Robin Hood, yet with the port of an emperor, if need be, calm, serious, and fit to stand the gaze of millions. The open air and the fields, the street and public chambers, are the places where man executes his will. Let him yield or divide the scepter at the door of the house. Woman, with her instinct of behavior, instantly detects in man a love of trifles, any coldness or imbecility, or, in short, any want of that large, flowing, and magnanimous deportment which is indispensable as an exterior in the hall. Our American institutions have been friendly to her, and at this moment I esteem it a chief felicity of this country that it excels in women. A certain awkward consciousness of inferiority in the men may give rise to the new chivalry in behalf of women's rights. Certainly let her be as much better placed in the laws and in social forms as the most zealous reformer can ask, but I confide so entirely in her inspiring and musical nature that I believe only herself can show us how she shall be served. The wonderful generosity of her sentiments raises her at times into heroic and godlike regions, and verifies the pictures of Minerva, Juno, or Polymnia, and by the firmness with which she treads her upward path she convinces the coarsest calculators that another road exists than that which their feet know. But besides those who make good in our imagination the place of muses and Delphic sibyls, are there not women who fill our vase with wine and roses to the brim, so that the wine runs over and fills the house with perfume, who inspire us with courtesy, who unloose our tongues and we speak, who anoint our eyes and we see? We say things we never thought to have said. For once our walls of habitual reserve vanished and left us at large. We were children playing with children in a wild field of flowers. Steep us, we cried, in these influences for days, for weeks, and we shall be sunny poets, and will write in many-colored words the romance that you are. Was it Hafiz or Fidusi that said of his Persian Lilla, She was an elemental force, and astonished me by her amount of life when I saw her day after day radiating every instant redundant joy and grace on all around her. She was a solvent powerful to reconcile all heterogeneous persons into one society, like air or water, an element of such a great range of affinities that it combines readily with a thousand substances. Where she is present, all others will be more than they are wont. She was a unit and whole, so that whatever she did became her. She had too much sympathy and desire to please, than that you could say her matters were marked with dignity, yet no princess could surpass her clear and erect demeanor on each occasion. She did not study Persian grammar, nor the books of the seven poets, but all the poems of the seven seemed to be written upon her. For though the bias of her nature was not to thought but to sympathy, Yet was she so perfect in her own nature as to meet intellectual persons by the fullness of her heart, warming her by her sentiments, believing as she did that by dealing nobly with all, all would show themselves noble. I know that this Byzantine pile of chivalry or fashion, which seems so fair and picturesque to those who look at the contemporary facts for science or for entertainment, is not equally pleasant to all spectators. The constitution of our society makes it a giant's castle to the ambitious youth who have not found their names enrolled in its golden book, and in whom it has excluded from its coveted honors and privileges. 
they have yet to learn that its seeming grandeur is showy and relative it is great by their allowance its proudest gates will fly open at the approach of their courage and virtue for the present distress however of those who are predisposed to suffer from the tyrannies of this caprice there are easy remedies to remove your residence a couple of miles or at most four will commonly relieve the most extreme susceptibility for the advantages which fashion values are plants which thrive in very confined localities in a few streets namely out of this precinct they go for nothing or of no use in the farm in the forest in the market in war in the nuptial society in the literary or scientific circle at sea in friendship in the heaven of thought and the virtue but we have lingered long enough in these painted courts the worth of the thing signified must vindicate our taste for the emblem everything that is called fashion and courtesy humbles itself before the cause and fountain of honor creator of titles and dignities namely the heart of love this is the royal blood this the fire which in all countries and contingencies will work after its kind and conquer and expand all that approaches it this gives new meanings to every fact this impoverishes the rich suffering no grandeur but its own what is rich are you rich enough to help anybody to succor the unfashionable and the eccentric rich enough to make the canadian in his wagon the itinerant with his consul's paper which commends him to the charitable the swarthy italian with his few broken words of english the lame pauper haunted by overseers from town to town even the poor insane or besotted wreck of man or woman feel the noble exception of your presence and your house from the general bleakness and stoniness to make such feel that they were greeted with a voice which made them both remember and hope what is vulgar but to refuse the claim on acute and conclusive reasons what is gentle but to allow it and give their heart and yours one holiday from the national caution without the rich heart wealth is an ugly beggar the king of shiraz could not afford to be so bountiful as the poor osman who dwelt at his gate osman had a humanity so broad and deep that although his speech was so bold and free with the koran as to disgust all the dervishes yet there was never a poor outcast eccentric or insane man some fool who had cut off his beard or who had been mutilated under a vow, or had a pet madness in his brain, but fled at once to him. That great heart lay there so sunny and hospitable in the centre of the country, that it seemed as if the instinct of all sufferers drew them to his side. And the madness which he harboured he did not share. Is not this to be rich, this only to be rightly rich? but i shall hear without pain that i play the courtier very ill and talk of that which i do not well understand it is easy to see that what is called by distinction society and fashion has good law as well as bad has much that is necessary and much that is absurd too good for banning and too bad for blessing it reminds us of a tradition of the pagan mythology in an attempt to settle its character I overheard Jove one day, said Silenus, talking of destroying the earth. He said it had failed. They were all rogues and vixens, who went from bad to worse as fast as the days succeeded each other. Minerva said she hoped not. They were only ridiculous little creatures, with this odd circumstance, that they had a blur or indeterminate aspect, seen far or seen near. If you called them bad, they would appear so. If you called them good, they would appear so, and there was no one person or action among them who would not puzzle her owl, much more all Olympus, to know whether it was fundamentally bad or good. End of essay number four.